I would like to fulfill the request of a friend who just sent me a message and would like to hear what I've just said in English, being the day that commemorates Eros. And I do have it in English, and here it is. It is our destiny to fall in love with what tends to flee from us. That which whimsically exists, the intangible. As Socrates substantiates in Plato's Symposium, we long for that which we do not possess. And on that longing, we embroider our dreams, our most ambitious expectations of life. It leaves a bittersweet taste in the palate of our soul, though. For just as we think we are within reach of its essence, it is consumed into oblivion, for the permanence of Eros remains unattainable. As extreme as, uh, as it may sound, testimonial to its validity are all that the great loves recorded in history, be they fictitious or not. One not only need reflect on affairs like those of Orpheus and Eurydice, uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Apollo and Daphne, Paris and Helen, Anthony and Cleopatra, comparing them for their abrupt endings. They all bore death and destruction, the element of their greatness and the consequence of their unfulfillment. The winged god is a fleeting god, and this is why he has wings, always armed with a bow and arrow. And uh, he's a Parthian archer of a deity, whose essence is the hunt. It is no wonder he is depicted with his bow and arrow, therefore. Nor can we avoid its sting and consequent wound if his dart strikes home whether we are hurt by the idol of our fancy due to rejection, or feel deeply disappointed when the model of our dreams fail, uh, falls quite short of our expectations once we strip it of the mystery our mind's eye has weaved it in, because human imagination is much stronger than the material world encompassing our reality. Perhaps, as Aristophanes humorously, but not without metaphorical validity, states in the Symposium of Plato, we all hail from androgynous creatures that were once content in their wholeness, never desiring anything since they possessed everything in their state of completion, being both male and female. In fact, they possessed such strength in their bisexual form that they aspired to climb to the heavens and dwell amongst the gods. Seeing this, Zeus decided to weaken them by splitting them in two, severing the one part from the other, the male from the female respectively. Since then, each part has sought to reunite itself with its missing half, its kindred spirit, so to say. And although this search may, more often than not, prove to be vain, so much creativity is born out of it. For his physical love is capable of producing the fruit of life, so is the quest of Eros itself, a spontaneous generation of the arts, be it music, poetry, sculpture, or any high-spirited creation that praises the turbulence uh, the mischievous winged deity steers in us. Besides, only the love-stricken are capable of offering a flower without the slightest pang of obligation. And only they, the love-stricken, can truly boast of altruism in their acts, of self-sacrifice, regardless of the consequences. And why not? All is forgiven in his name, in the name of Eros. And even the extreme actions of one smitten by the god's dart are deemed to be not less than heroic. Hence the ancient Greek saying, Eros, the one unvanquish, unvanquishable, sorry, slip, a slip of the tongue, unvanquishable in battle. According to ancient Greek religion, Eros was the first god in creation. And how could he not be? Since nothing can be conceived without him. He bore light, and light in turn gave birth to the first gods. According to Hesiod's Theogony, but also the Orphians before them, his original name was Phanis. Phanis in Greek means he who reveals. The verb 
phanerono in Greek still resounds, the fact that Eros reveals all things so they can be united. Eros, according to Hesiod, pre-existed the universe, and although he cannot have direct offspring himself, he is the driving force that unites all other forces and urges creation. Although the eldest of the deities, he is always portrayed young, even an infant, an image which implies that he is immature and impulsive. And indeed, the love-stricken of any age feels like a child and behaves accordingly in his infatuated state, smitten by the god's dart. Our very relationship with life is an erotic one, and any optimism we derive about our being is begotten out of this relationship, this erotic relationship we have with life. We are no less in love with the nature of ourselves than Narcissus was with his own reflection in the pond. It is through this measure of ourselves that we seek the desirous mate of our dreams, whom we consider to be more perfect than life itself, since on him or her we project the delusion of our own supposed perfection. And it really is a delusion since we attribute to the object of our desire elements that we have, we essentially need to achieve completion. Uh, and this is why Socrates, through Diotima, states that Eros is actually the child of poverty, always requiring something that he does not possess. Therefore, we truly fall in love with that which we do not possess. The remaining question is, since what we do not possess always changes, like a fleeting dream, do we ever fulfill a quest? Allow me to read a poem that I wrote about Eros, if I can find it in this book here, which I wrote many, many years ago. 1994, in fact. What's Eros but the substance of a wandering dream in flight, a dream that nourishes that deity with, with its luminescent light, interprets he the universe through mesmerizing eyes, and looks upon the attire of souls beyond their mortal flesh, which palpitate deceivingly in their organic mesh. The enfolded immaterial power dwelling in his realm so clearly manifests itself through plaintive, restless eyes, the nature of one's frame and build, his temperamental guise, Oh, what's existence other than a biorhythmic dance, a soul-composed choreography of an erotic trance, voices, human utterances, libations to the god, are all a song in timpani, a symphony in praise, a bittersweet sad melody, Eurydice to raise. Poetry interprets this enchanting dream in words, distilling its ethereal substance into fluid of life, that nourishes the winged god in his perpetual strife. Speaking of Eros, I would like to close. Oh, by the way, this is the 14th of uh, February, and everybody is in a state of passion. And it seems that the god of the sea is also in a state of passion, as I will show you the tempestuous waters of the sea. Have a great afternoon, friends. Thank you for listening.